I want to talk to you today about the marriage. And actually, we're going to go right past the marriage to the dance. We're going to talk about the dance uh, that Jesus danced. Uh, he, he, he played and danced to a particular tune that just uh, astounds me. There is a sheet of paper that you might have grabbed on your way in. If you didn't grab it, grab or raise your hand. We'll bring one around to you. And it's got some scriptures on it. I want to look at these scriptures together. I made it in big print so that you might be able to read it uh, even in the dark. So uh, the first place I want to stop is in John chapter 1, verse number 14 and don't tune out as soon as you hear the opening line because we use that at Christmas so often. But here we go. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. I want to tune in on the beholding his glory. We beheld his glory, and the glory was as of the only begotten of the Father. Can I just get an agreement here today? that there has never been and there never will be another like Jesus. He is the only begotten, eternal Son of God. And we are adopted into his family because of what Jesus has done for us. So Jesus is uh, God the Father, acquired a son. In fact, uh, that's stirring in my heart. I, there's this message about the firstborn that is for our Christmas season that I want to share with you uh, that has just been a powerful uh, recent revelation to me as the Spirit began showing it to me. I just think it will bless you as well. So uh, reading again, verse number 14, John chapter 1, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Now here's the phrase, full of grace and truth. John, the Baptist, bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. See how that works? Jesus was before John, so John recognizes him as being preeminent. Verse number 16. And of his fullness, Jesus, we have all received, read it with me, grace. And of his fullness, read with me, and of his fullness, we have all received, and grace for grace. God gives grace to receive his grace. For the law was through, the, through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. Jesus was the first ever to marry grace and truth together. Here's what I've learned. In these um, years that I have lived, which I was telling Judy the other day, I said, I just did the math. I'm closer to 70 than I am 60. And she says, I know, you're getting old. And I, I was looking for comfort. And she threw me under the bus. And she said, yes. You're closer to 70 than to 60. Get used to it. I said, well, I guess there's no going back. And she said, no, not on my watch. There's no going back. And I said, well, this is very depressing. And she said, get over your bad self. So I'm here getting over my bad self. I had a moment. In all these years, I have noticed that people tend to be polarized, kind of one thing or the other. Let's just take grace and truth. Our personalities, whether it's our nurture or our nature, probably both, we tend to be either people who gravitate to truth or people who gravitate to grace. And we're struggling with that grace part right now because... Sometimes grace is misunderstood to mean tolerance. 
And uh, there's a few people that I have met are, that are little more than upset with all of the redefining and definitions being changed under the guise of tolerance. But see, that's not what grace is. But I digress. People tend to be either grace-oriented or truth-oriented, conservative or liberal. We tend to be one or the other. There just seems to be that people tend to be one thing or the other. Now, I want to mention to you that the entry point for the Word of God was through Moses. And it was grace to them to receive this revelation from God because they had been living in bondage. Before that, they had been living in idolatry. And before that, they were just flat out pagan. If you read the testimony of Genesis, after man's fall, mankind goes downhill very rapidly. One of the things that concerns me today isn't so much left or right as it is a return to straight out paganism and idolatry in a nation that was once almost wholly Christian. So we're not post-Christian as much as we are neo-pagan. Just trying to put it into perspective. So walking in a balance or a marriage between grace and truth is harder than ever. Moses was given a law. It was straight up, flat out truth. Straight, like, do this, do not do that. It was, as truth is, immovable. It was unflexible. It was literally written in stone. It was universal. And it was just, and according to the Apostle Paul, it is the epitome of righteousness. The, the law, Paul the Apostle himself said that the law is holy, righteous, and just. What's the problem then? It's, it's, it's okay, we can go to our sin nature. And so when you take sinful people and you give them a law, then they either embrace it or they rebel against it. One or the other. People who want to rebel against it, of course, do not want justice, even if they cry for it. They want mercy. They want grace. They want, you know, judging on a curve. So Moses received this amazing revelation which was in it was an act of God's grace and it showed them it gave them a guideline it gave them uh, if you will it it gave them a sense of um, security it gave them a sense of responsibility and an appeal it showed men how to live with other men. I was, my car was broken into. I was robbed. Uh, this is the second time it's happened to me since we've lived here in Warmleysburg. Tools were stolen. And, um, you know, the first thing that happened when I realized that I had been robbed is that there's certain kind of indignant feeling that comes on me like I had been violated, like I had become a victim of a crime. I reported it to the police, and they said, uh, the police is, uh, I know this policeman, he said, Pastor Rich, you're one of the nicest men I know, and I'm so sorry it happened to you, but don't take it personally. I said, I don't take it personally. I, I, in fact, I don't want people taking anything at all. I want, that, that's the problem, you know. <laughs> He said, you know what I mean? And, and, and I said, so here's the deal. I said, I, 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 was, I, I need to build this shed out back and put my tools in there, but instead I carry them in my trunk. 
And he says, Pastor, do you need a shed? <laughs> yeah. No, like, no, 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 please. Don't, don't build me a shed. I, you know, I'm just telling you the facts. So I would prefer, now he doesn't give me any hope for this. I would prefer that whoever caught, whoever did that would be caught and that they would be able to return those items and that I'd be able to look them in the eye and say, I forgive you, you know. I, I would, that's what I would prefer. Justice would demand something a little more than that, but, you know, um, it's probably not going to happen. We all want justice deep down inside. We know it when we see wrong. We feel violated, and we cry for justice. Problem is that when we are the perpetrator, everyone wants grace. Everyone wants mercy because perpetrators are caught and we have to admit it. I don't have the time to go into all that. I wish we could go further in all of that right now. Here's my feeling. My, this is my educated guess after many years of studying Moses, many years of studying the Gospels and Jesus, many years of studying Paul and his writings. I'm going to tell you that the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious elites of their day, who wanted to keep people in a sense of law and order and obedience and devotion to God, struggled because they knew that the law could only show them to be right or show them to be wrong and not give them the power to change. So I have contended, in fact, when I taught the book of Romans um, uh, here, um, and when I, was, I taught uh, for the um, Pendel um, School of Ministry, um, when I taught Romans, um, I, I would sit people down and say, this is what I believe has happened. Scribes and Pharisees, many years removed from Moses, trying to interpret him, trying to keep and establish a just kind of society, has done something like this. My imagination is kicking in, and I'm just imagining a room full of scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, perhaps a few high priests or ex-high priests, and they're talking about the law, and they're talking about its application, and they pull out their cigars, and they start smoking, and maybe they drink a few beers, and after they've gotten relaxed, they start to admit to each other that there's something that is missing. It's like the law is holy, righteous, and just, but there still seems to be something that is missing, either in our understanding of it or our application of it. And I believe that that's exactly where Saul of Tarsus was when the Spirit of God in God's great act of grace and mercy towards him, knocked him down and showed him Jesus. And having had this revelation, he found the missing piece. So Paul is known as the apostle of grace. I talked with you last week about the significance of the door being open, not just for Jews, but then for Gentiles. That's huge. Okay, but Jesus was able to take the law and truth and marry it together in what we would call grace. Now, you can see it for some reason. I can't see it, so I'm going to just take a chance at it. There is truth, okay? For some reason, guys, my screen's not working. I don't know. I can see the time and a blank screen. But anyways, truth. Now, grace. Grace gives us the favor that was prevented from us because we were disobedient to the truth. So we receive God's grace. We receive God's favor. Really, it's on account of Jesus. We receive, we inherit God's grace through Jesus, and we inherit the favor that Jesus has with the Father. We inherit that. 
So it is really completely undeserved. It is completely a gift that is given to us. And then the other thing is we receive an empowerment to change. So Jesus was this amazing balance between truth and grace. So I'm going to take you to an example. I think it's better to picture it than to try to describe it. In John chapter 8, verse number 1, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came to the temple and the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. So he sits down on the steps of the temple, which is uh, rabbinic fashion. Scribes, Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst or in front of him, they said to him, Rabbi, this woman was caught in adultery. Just so you don't let your mind wander too far, he says, in the very act. First of all, I don't know exactly how they found this woman in the very act of committing adultery, but they did. You can imagine them grabbing this woman up with vicious hatred and a sense of indignant in their heart. They grab her in her night clothes, pull her out in the street, not being fully dressed, exposed before everybody, throws her at Jesus' feet. If you imagine me teaching right now and that were to happen, someone were just brought here. Verse number five says, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. And I'm hoping that when I read this that you're not thinking about adultery, but you're thinking about all the things that people are clam clamoring for and all the identities and all the hyphenations and all the things that people are claiming and how difficult it is to navigate um, our world right now. I'm hoping you're thinking of someone who has now been caught and it is obvious to everyone the sin. And verse 5, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Um... What is at stake here is, is very, very deep. This is like the proverbial question that you get asked if someone says, Pastor Rich, do you still beat your wife? If you say yes, you're in trouble. If you say no, you're in trouble because you, it infers that you once did, you know. So it's like a no win. You can't answer it with yes or no. You have to say, I never did beat my wife. I haven't started beating my wife, and neither do I intend to beat my wife, nor your wife or anyone else's for that matter. I mean, you have to be very thorough today. All right. The test that was set in front of them was that if Jesus were to say yes, take her and stone her. First of all, most of us would probably recognize that would be a difficult thing for Jesus to do because Jesus is not just truth, but he's also grace, right? He loves people. He didn't come, as in Jesus' own words, he didn't come to judge the world. He came to save the world. Right? He didn't come to judge. He came to save. And then he said, the word will judge you in the end. So, if Jesus would have said, yes, take her out back and stone her to death, then Jesus would also have been in trouble with the Romans because the Jews did not have legal permission 
to stone anyone, even though it was a part of their law. There was a law that superseded theirs, and that was the law of Rome. So now Jesus would have been in the middle of politics. He would have been in the middle of, of, a, of a civil dispute. So now they could actually take Jesus to the magistrate and say, this guy condemned someone to death without your permission. Jesus was not going to buy it. He just stoops down and writes on the ground with his finger. We have no idea what he wrote. We have no idea what he wrote. I have a couple of thoughts on that, but we don't have time for it right now. This much we do know, that the finger of God in the Bible, all throughout Old and New Testament, the finger of God always represented God and his judgment. God in acting judgment. So Jesus just begins to write, and he does not go for the trap, he, but he does remind them that God will, there's a day of judgment. So they continued asking him, and he raised himself up and said, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. So Jesus is dancing with truth and grace right now. There's a dance going on here. And I love it because at the end of this, I'm going to ask you if you would consider saying, oh God, I want to learn how to, I want to learn how to dance with truth and grace. I, in order for the church to get a voice again in the world, we have got to learn how to be absolutely unmovable with truth, and yet at the same time, marry it together with grace. Because at the end of the day, what we really want is not fairness. What we want is justice. And not only justice, but we want changed behavior. We want people and their lives to be transformed, our own included in that. So he again stoops down and he writes on the ground. And those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, I'm going to suggest something that one day in heaven we'll know who this woman is. I think that we know her name. It's just not been revealed to us. I think in the Gospels her name is there, but we don't know her name right now. This was the Holy Spirit protecting her dignity. Jesus says, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you and she said no one lord interesting thing is that in the book of deuteronomy in chapter 17 verses 1 to 7 it talks specifically about sins that deserve the death penalty of which adultery was one of them you could not convict anyone on the witness of one person it had to be two or more. One person could not convict someone to death. Because it's just now it's just an accusation, right? I could just make an accusation and then people would get a knee-jerk reaction and take you out back and stone you to death. No, it took two or three witnesses or more to establish this. And by the way, in the Law of Moses, the two or three who brought the accusation after there had been a trial, after there had been thorough examination, they were the first to throw the stone in judgment once the court had found this person guilty. So even in Moses' law, there was a lot more grace than you think, a lot more mercy. No one, Lord... And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. 
Now, I like this a lot because Jesus is saying, first of all, today's not the day for that. And secondly, there's no dignity in your behavior. If you continue in this behavior, there is no dignity in it. It will lead you to heartache again and again and again. So you see this marriage between grace and the grace is I'm not going to condemn you. I'm actually going to die for you. And I'm not going to let you continue in this pathway because there is no dignity in it and there is no honor in it. And you will eventually find yourself in a very terrible strait. So no, I'm not going to condemn you. But no, you cannot continue this behavior. Let me bring out two or three other things and bring this thing to a close. Number one is that this is why it's important when Jesus was asked about divorce, why this is so important. Because the scribes and the Pharisees said that Moses gave us a bill of divorcement. We could divorce our wife for any reason we want to, as long as we gave them a bill of divorcement. And Jesus said, from the beginning, it wasn't so. And Moses gave that to you as a concession why? Because a woman without legal proof found with another man could be stoned to death as an adulteress. So if she has legal proofs, my, proof, my husband divorced me, then she, and she's with another man who in their culture, she didn't have many options. She didn't have many other options. So the, her best option was to find another man who would take her in, provide for her, and, um, and keep her. Second thing I'd like to point out is that in the Old Testament law, there is a, a procedure, there is a, it's like a fail safe. If you, for example, accidentally killed someone, you know, let's just use driving, we're driving our car and we accidentally kill someone, the the, pe the penalty for uh, taking someone's life is your for yours. So um, if you're worried that they're going to come and take you and kill you, one of the things that you could do is run to the altar and take hold of the or horn on the altar, which was outside of the temple, and you could hold on to that until people heard and you had a fair trial. Let me just pick this one up. You would have a fair trial and you would have a fair hearing before they made judgment. So it's, it's called running to the altar. The interesting thing is that with Moses and the altar area that was with the tabernacle, you could have done that. And with Solomon's temple, a person could have done that. But with Herod's temple, there was a courtyard of the Gentiles. And then beyond that, there was a courtyard of the women. And it literally would prevent you from going any further. So I'm just here to remind you that no woman could have ever ran for the altar and grabbed a hold of the horns of the altar and been saved or spared from being stoned to death is a huge injustice guards would have stopped them they couldn't have done that so here we are jesus sitting outside of the courtyard on the steps and he's teaching someone brings this woman and uh, they want to kill her they want to trap jesus and they want to put an end to both of these people if you would stand with me Number one, Jesus could see past the actions of the woman into a broken person who needed God's grace. Number two, Jesus did not break the law. He upheld it. And number three, Jesus could see into the hearts of these evil men who used this occasion as an occasion to attack him and to possibly destroy a woman. And as I have shared with you in the past, there is no evil that is more evil 
than when evil is done in the name of religion. The church of Jesus Christ has got to learn how to dance with truth and grace. A beautiful marriage. Just like those two there, they're celebrating. The marriage ceremony, we remind them that the two become one. It's not easy. It's not always easy to figure out what to do. That's why it takes the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us. But I believe so strongly that God is calling his bride to learn how to hold fast to truth while extending forth grace in a beautiful dance. I will tell you that should you choose to do that, there will be people who will be very upset and angry with you, which is sad. And it usually isn't the world. As a matter of fact, I don't believe that the world has as much problem with Jesus as the world has had with the church. So there has to be something in our representation of him that's got to change. So, Father, I pray today that you would lead us into this wonderful dance, holding fast to truth while holding forth grace. We're not giving up the values, but we refuse to give up on people. There's something very, very special here, Lord, in this word and in this moment. And I'm asking that you would help us. You would help us to get this. You would help us to understand the dance. And so, Lord, I, I just admit, I'm like, my inability to dance is legendary. I would have to be taught if, I, if my life depended on dancing, I would have to be taught. Someone would have to take me by the hand and teach me how to dance. I don't know how to dance. And that is our situation today. We don't know how to dance with grace and truth. But Jesus, you're full of grace and truth. So help us, we pray. So help us. Lead us by the hand. In Jesus' name we pray.